everyone. Thank you for coming to today's program. Um, stories from a, from a newspaper reporter by Howard Coffin. Um, and on behalf of the Bridgewater Historical Society, we'd like to welcome you. We'd also like to thank uh, Alice Paglia and the Bridgewater Grange for allowing us to use the Grange Hall. Um, we really appreciate that. A couple of quick things before we get started. Um, if we have to evacuate, exit here, exit here. Bathrooms are over there. And if you could silence any uh, electronic equipment you have, that would be appreciated. I'd also like to invite you to the Bridgewater Historical Society. We are open for the season. We are open on the second and fourth uh, Saturdays of the month from 10 to 2. Uh, we have a great exhibit this year of uh, farms and families of Bridgewater. We have an extensive collection of, of old photographs and artifacts that we've gotten from uh, donations and, and on loan. Uh, it really looks pretty good, you know. So if, you, if you're in the area on, on those Saturdays, please stop by 12 North Bridgewater Road in the old uh, red brick uh, schoolhouse. And of course, it's always free and it's handicapped accessible. Um, also, uh, invite you to visit our website, um, bridgewaterhistory.org. There's a lot of uh, information on there about Bridgewater and the residents of Bridgewater. Uh, and also our Facebook page. Today we're also uh, being uh, recorded by the Okemo Valley TV and we'll have links on our website as to, uh, to, to see that once this is over. So for today, Howard Coffin. We know Howard as a Vermont Civil War historian and author, but for 12 years he was a reporter for the Rutland Herald and for six years with the Christian Science Monitor. So today he's going to talk to us a little bit about those experiences. So please give a warm welcome to Howard Hawkins. I've got work to do. There we go. Well, nice to be back. A few words of explanation before I start in on the talk. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say that uh, I wish my sister were here. Uh, my sister Jane died about a year ago, and I miss her uh, terribly. And we had a lot of good times together. And I particularly wish she was here now because she was the world's biggest Celtics fan. And she's missing, you know, they're playing tonight again, you know, she's missing. And her favorite player was Robert Williams. And uh, I mean, he's tremendous and he's young and he's going to be so great. She would have loved every second of this. And they're going to win again tonight, absolutely. I was uh, called by Jeanette. Uh, Jeanette calls me every year. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Keep doing it. <laughs> and asked if I could speak about the Cog Railway disaster. And my response was, I don't know enough about it. Yes, I was the first reporter to get to the scene. But I said, I'll tell you about that. But I can't, I don't have a, I couldn't give a full talk. And so we negotiated here, and I'm going to talk about, first talk about that, and then I'm going to talk about, uh, tell you some stories from my newspapering career, which was, yes, um, 12 years, uh, 12 years long. If you're interested in the getting really deep into that Cargo Railway disaster, the guy to talk to is the former WCAX TV reporter, Tim Lewis, who has sort of last 30 years has made a hobby out of, of researching the Cog Railway, and I'm sure he'd be happy to come down here and talk. 
Uh, you know, he, I don't know if a lot of people know it, but his father is quite famous. His father is Danny Gore, the comedian uh, who does that Vermont uh, act. But anyway, I don't know enough about it, but I will tell you what I know about the Cog Railway disaster. 55 years ago? Well, The Cog Railway has wrecked on Mount Washington. People are dead and apparently a lot are injured. Howard, can you slide over there first thing in the morning and be sure you take a camera? That's about what the managing editor of the Rutland Herald said to me on the night of September 17th, 1967, a Sunday night. The manager of the Rutland Herald was Kendall Wild, I think the best newspaper man who ever was in Vermont. And when you when you said when he said go somewhere, you went. And uh, believe you me, his the phrase he always used: "Could you slide on over?" Now it's quite a trip from North Shrewsbury, where I live to Mount Washington, but I was up at first light and on my way in my Volkswagen Beetle, and I made it, as I was supposed to, at 8 o'clock. By 8 o'clock, I was at the base station of the Cog Railway. By the way, I'd never been up the Cog Railway, never been on it. Been to Mount Washington a couple of times, but... It was a beautiful sunny morning, and I can remember when I was going over the heights up in Danville, I could see the summit of Mount Washington. That's rare. You can't. Maybe one day in ten you can see the top of Washington from the Danville Heights. A beautiful morning. So I got to the, uh, uh, the base of the uh, uh, railway, got out of my Volkswagen, grabbed my camera, and thank God I grabbed my parka, which had a hood on it. <laughs> now, it was 70 degrees, and the sun was shining. It was utterly beautiful. And somebody said, what have you got that jacket for? And I said, well, I've heard stories about this place. So I walked over to the base lodge of the Cog Railway, where you got your tickets, and the track was right there and so forth. And I bet there were 50 media people there. TV, uh, reporters, radio, television, they were everywhere. And there was a spokesman for the railroad, and he had a microphone, and he stepped up to the microphone right after I got there, and he said, no one is allowed on the mountain. Somebody raised their hand and said, well, can we drive up the auto road? And uh, the answer was, the auto road is closed. Nobody can go up. Somebody else said, well, can we climb up? And uh, the reply to that was, no, we'll stop you. So here I had driven way the hell over there. And uh, well, we, asked, we started asking questions. And the, the spokesman said that a train was leaving in a few minutes to go up and bring down the wrecked engine. And I could see it warming up. You know, the cog railway, the engine pushes, pushes the cars up. And when it's coming down, it comes down first and it slows down the car. And I could see there was a flat car and the engine and they were warming up. And pretty soon they started chugging along toward the mountain. I drifted off over toward the parking lot, kind of hanging around with my parka and my camera, and watched the train go a little faster and a little faster. And then I started to run. <laughs> Ran like... Hi, Corinne. <laughs> That's my second cousin over there. I started to run like the Dickens, and I jumped on that flat car. And there were probably 10 workmen on that. And one of them grabbed my arm so I wouldn't fall, fall off, and another one looked at me and said, well, I guess we're stuck with you. Because now he's going so fast that I couldn't get off. And so I was on. And up we went. 
the, the railway disaster had happened the previous late afternoon. The last train was coming down from the summit of the mountain, which of course the top of Washington is 6,288 feet. And it was coming down, it's, it's, it's fairly, a fairly gradual descent from the summit house until you get to where the mountain pitches down. And it was just at the top of where it begins to pitch, where there was a, 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 where there was a siding. Uh, where the uh, skyline siding, where a train could pull off to let a train coming down or one going up go by. The last train coming down uh, uh, had, had an engine and one car. The capacity of the car was 55 passengers, but there were eight, at least 85 people in the car because it was the last train. It came down about a mile and reached that switch. And as, as it went through that switch, it didn't pull off, it just went straight through the switch, the engine bumped, went right up in the air, and came slamming down on the track and separated from the car. Now remember, the car's behind it. And the engine starts to roll. It rolls of only about 40 feet and goes off the right side of the track, the right side coming down. The passenger car now has nothing to stop it, and it picks up speed. It rolls at least 500 feet. And according to the railway, it went off the track somewhere uh, at a speed somewhere between 20 and 40 miles per hour. I knew two people who were on that train. One was Paul Rassico, George Rassico's brother. Yes. He and his lady friend, and I can't remember her name, but I think she was a teacher down here at the high school. Uh, Paul told me years later, he said, that, that car was going a lot faster than 40 miles an hour. Uh, anyway, they knew, they, uh, everybody on the train had, you know, ridden up and they knew the terrain and they knew that not far below where they went off was Jacob's Ladder. The steep, how many of you have been up to Cog Railway, by the way? Oh, see? Okay, good. Because not, Jacob's Ladder is not only the steepest part of the climb, but it's also the highest. It's a trestle. It's 30 to 60 feet above the rocks. And believe me, the top of Mount Washington is all jagged rocks. So as people, as the, as the people in the car saw that nothing was going to prevent the uh, increase of speed, people began to smash out the windows and jump. Several of those who jumped on the right side were crushed by the car. And the thing went fell about five to six feet down onto the rocks. Virtually everybody was injured. Eight people died. I knew, in later years, I knew another man who was on that train. His name was, and whenever I say his name, I'm going to say it the way he said it. His name was Everett the Merritt. He ran a sawmill in Wolcott. And Everett DeMerritt landed on a pile of bodies and people, and he didn't, never got a scratch on it. I remember he told me that. He said it was a miracle. They got uh, a doc. There was a doctor at the top of the mountain. He got down uh, to the site as fast as he could, and the train came up. To, another train came up to take the injured. They were taken to hospitals at Littleton and St. Johnsbury. Now there was a hiking trail that crossed the uh, Cog Railway about 250 feet from the siding. And uh, suggestions began to be made around the trail train company that a hiker had, had put a rail across the tracks. Apparently the problem was that a rail was lying across the tracks for some reason. 
I seriously doubt that a hiker had anything to do with that accident. That's, hikers aren't that type. Anyway, something, it hit something and it bounced. Now, to go back, when I reached the crash site on that train going up to bring down the engine, I got off the train when it stopped right by the engine. And I looked back and I could see, uh, it was so clear I could see Camel's Hump. Wonderful day. And I immediately got off the train and went and got all my, and started taking pictures. And I got pictures of the train, uh, of the engine and pictures of the, of the, of the passenger car. And uh, I did it quickly. And it was a damn good thing I did because within an hour, winds were blowing at 70 miles an hour. The sky had blacked out and snow was pouring down. It was the fa fastest change in weather I ever saw. The crew was very kind to me and the engineer said, come on in the cab. He said, you're going to freeze to death out there. So I spent a good portion of the day watching things uh, from within the cab. It was mid-afternoon when they finally got the engine back on the tracks, and I don't rem that's a long time ago, and I don't remember exactly how they did it, but I don't think that they had a crane of any kind. I think they somehow put rails up to the rails, and I don't know how it was done, but they got that damn thing back on the track. And it was about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I think, when we started back down. So it was the working engine, the flat car where we all were. I'd gone, the, the weather had let up a little. I was back out on the flat car. And, uh, and then the wrecked engine. Well, we started down. And we came to Jacob's Ladder. And all of a sudden, there was a bump. <laughs> and that engine, that wrecked engine, began to rise up over the car we were, the flat car we were on. And one of the workmen looked at me and said, Coffin, we're going to have a choice. If that thing comes over the car, he said, it's going to crush us. So the choice will be to get crushed by the engine or jump onto, off Jacob's ladder. And he said, either way, you're going to die, so pick your choice. <laughs> well, they stopped the train, and somehow they got that engine under control. Phew. And we made it all the way back down to the base lodge. Well, as we approached the base lodge, Howard jumped off the flat car, and ran like hell for his Volkswagen Beetle. Somebody was running after me. They never caught me. I jumped in the car and drove to Rutland as fast as I could because there was no way to get film. We had to have the film, and I had to get it to the newsroom to get it developed. And by God, we had pictures all over the front page of the Herald the next morning, the only paper in the country that did. We scooped the world. It was, I was so damned happy. Well, three weeks, I think about three weeks later, there was a meeting of the New Hampshire Public Utilities Commission at the State House in Concord to investigate the wreck. And I insisted, and the Herald wanted me to be there. Absolutely go there. Well, I got delayed somehow, getting to Concord. And the meeting started at 10, and I think it was like 10.15 when I got there. And as, and as uh, Jeanette can tell you, I'm usually on time, right? So the meeting had started, and I walked into the foyer of the State House. And there was that same huge group of journalists all gathered in the, in the lobby there. And uh, I said, where's the meeting? 
And he said, well, it's, it's going on in there. I said, well, I want to go in. And, the, and the, whoever, one of the state officials said, you can't. It's a closed meeting. And I said, there's no, there's no uh, press in there? And his response was, well, of course the union leader's in there. <laughs> I said, what? And Because a lot of cog railways in New Hampshire. What? Mount Washington. In New Hampshire. Yeah. No. Fair question. Yeah. Yeah. It was all in all the New Hampshire story. Sorry. There were quite a few Vermonters on the train, so that made it fair game, of course. But. So anyway, uh, the Manchester Union leader absolutely dominated New Hampshire. It dominated news coverage. It was owned by a guy named William Loeb, who owned several newspapers and lived in Woodstock for a while. Woodstock, Vermont, right here. He had a, ho a hobby of taking up with wealthy women. And he found one in Woodstock. That's where they look, I guess. And uh, anyway, the, so the union leader had a reporter and there were nobody else and, and nobody was complaining about it because it was New Hampshire and they were all used to it, but not me. I ran over, grabbed the door handle and ran into the hearing room and it was packed with people. Somebody was testifying, there were, you know, a commission was sitting around and all these state officials were there and the meeting stopped. And, some, and, the, and the chairman said, who, who are you? What are you doing? I said, I'm Howard Coffin from the Rutland Herald, and I'm here to cover this meeting. He said, you can't. You're out. And I said, the, the union leader's right there. I know him. That's Joe McQuaid. And he said, Joe, stay and you're leaving. I said, I'm not leaving here. You're going to have to arrest me. And the meeting ended. They, they called it. They ended it right there. I don't know what ever happened after that. But the meeting did not continue that day. But that was New Hampshire. Now, why did I go in there and make a fool of myself like that? Because we had been taught at the Rutland Herald that the public has a right to know. Because the, Amer the American Constitution has a First Amendment that guarantees the freedom of the press. It has that because the Founding Fathers wanted the press to inform the voting public. A democracy cannot function if it does not know what is going on in the country. It must know the truth, and that was the mission, as Kendall Weil told it to us at the Rutland Herald. We have a right to know. We have a right to be there. I don't know, really, the outcome of that investigation, but I don't think that a cause was ever firmly determined. All these hints about a hiker, the mystery hiker, who I don't think did it. I worked for 12 years at the Rutland Daily Herald. 12 wonderful years. Since that era of journalism in Vermont has been called the golden age of journalism, uh, we had some wonderful reporters, some very good news outlets, Channel 3, the Burlington Free Press, the Barry Montpelier Times Argus, Bennington Banner, Brattleboro Reformer, very, very good uh, news coverage. Uh, we worked very long and very hard for very little money. I started at the Rutland Herald at $80 a week. And when I left there 12 years later, I was making $150 a week. Uh, one day, I set the all-time record that still stands at the Herald by having 14 stories in one paper. But many days we wrote four and five stories, five and six typewritten pages long. I started in May of, of uh, 1966 uh, on the city desk where all beginning reporters uh, started. And I covered various things in Rutland City. And event by the fall, I was covering City Hall. I was the City Hall reporter. And then uh, I moved up. Eventually, I moved up uh, 
to cover Montpelier. Let me tell you one story that happened one night in the Rutland Herald that gets, really gets at the dedication of that paper to covering news. It was 11 o'clock at night in the newsroom. The paper was on deadline. The door to the newsroom, in front of the door to the newsroom, sat a 90-year-old man named John Pixley Clement, whose father, incidentally, had been governor of Vermont. He was a jolly old man, and we used to go party at his mansion after work. And he did little jobs, you know, editing little stories, you know, and, and when people would come to the door, he would deal with them and so forth. And in the desk beside him sat Kendall Wilde, the managing editor. 11, at about 11 o'clock, uh, John was sitting uh, by the door, and a man walked in with a rifle and pointed the rifle at John Clement. John Clement looked over at Kendall Wilde and said, Kendall, I think we have a problem. Kendall glanced up at the man, then looked at John and said, you're damn right we've got a problem, John. We're a half hour from deadline and the jump page isn't half full. <laughs> Kendall finished whatever he was doing, got up, walked over to the man, took the gun, and told him to get the hell out. And he did. The news came first. So how did Howard Coffin end up at the Standard? At the Rutland Herald, well, the answer starts at the Vermont Standard in Woodstock. And some of you will remember Benton Dryden, the editor. Benton Dryden hired me after I stopped trying to play sports to cover sports, high school sports, baseball, football, and basketball. My predecessor had been Bob Hager. Yeah, Bob and I were, were friends, and his father was my Sunday school teacher. So I learned a lot uh, working there at the, uh, at, at the Standard, and it was a good thing because I was a very bad student. When it came time, to go to college, the only college with my horrible grades that I could get into was Linden State Teachers College, and they would take anybody. Believe me, the tuition was $250 a year at that time. Imagine that. Uh, so I went uh, to Linden, and somehow I managed to stay there two and a half years. It was 1963 that I had my first hour of practice teaching. I was terrified of public speaking. I was terrified of getting in front of a class, and I had to teach Abraham Lincoln for an hour. And in the back of the room was Esther Buzzle, my supervisor, and every time I deviated one word from the book, she went, Add to this the fact that the night before the practice teaching, I had got a Dear John letter from my girlfriend who I was thinking about marrying. That it was too much to bear. I don't know how I got through that teaching session that lasted an hour. After it was over, I went back to my room. I got a friend of mine to buy me some beer. And at 10 o'clock that night, it was 15 below zero, I stepped out onto Route 5 in the middle of Linden, stuck out my thumb, a trucker stopped, and that was the end of college for Howard Coffin. I never went back. And I lost my student de deferment, and in within a year, I was drafted into the United States Army to serve two years. I did basic training at Fort Dix, and then I was sent to Fort Hood, Texas to become a medic, an Army medic. And while I was becoming a medic, I was called to the first sergeant's office. And the first sergeant said, I want you in this office at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning, Coffin. I said, why? He said, a new, the Post newspaper wants to interview you. I didn't even know there was a Post newspaper. 9 o'clock next morning, the Armored Sentinel, a reporter from the Armored Sentinel, turned out to be a 40,000 circulation paper. 
I said, what do you want to interview me for? He said, we want to do kind of a funny story about you. I said, why? He said, well, you're a coffin in the medical battalion. <laughs> During the course of that interview, <clears throat> I slipped in a question. <clears throat> do you have all the reporters you need at the paper? He said, no, as a matter of fact, we're looking for one right now. Bang. Two weeks later, I was on the Post newspaper, 40,000 circulation weekly paper. I was thrown into an office with reporters from the Philadelphia Daily News, Los Angeles Times, Associated Press, Houston Chronicle. And within six months, I became the best reporter in the paper because I knew that if I failed, I was off for Vietnam as a medic. I was writing to save my life. Five times until I got out of the Army a year and a half later, the commanding general canceled my orders to Vietnam. When it came time for me to get out of the Army, Major General George Mather called me into his office and said, Coffin, we want you to re-enlist for six years. I said, no, I'm going home. I have a job at the Rutland Daily Herald in Vermont. He said, no, we've got a deal for you you can't turn down. I said, yes, sir, what is it? He said, if you'll sign on for six more, we'll send you to Gettysburg as an aide to Dwight Eisenhower. I said, no. I went to the bar that night, ran into a sergeant who had served with Eisenhower in World War II and said, don't go near the, the bitch. He eats enlisted men alive. Anyway, I wasn't going to. So anyway, I came home and went to work for the Rutland Herald. By the uh, midwinter of 67, I was sent to Montpelier to cover the legislature. The legislature was already underway. I walked in the middle of it. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know anybody up there. I knew a couple of the reporters. I came in the front door. Nobody goes in the front door. People were running every which way, and I went up the stairs. I knew the governor's office was uh, at the top of the stairs, and when I came to the top of the stairs, a reporter that I knew, and I would come to know much better, named Mavis Doyle, who was the greatest legislative reporter Vermont ever produced, a tall Irish lady with a very severe uh, face, John Dumbbell knew her, uh, heart of gold, swore like a truck driver, the best, tough as nails. And I came up the stairs and I looked up and there was Mavis, and there against the wall in front of her was Governor Philip H. Hoff. And I heard Mavis say as she poked her finger into his chest, Governor, don't you ever lie to me again. And I said to myself, is this what I'm going to have to do up here? <laughs> Believe you me, I learned, and I learned fast. But I stayed at the State House for a couple of months. And Mavis and I ended up covering not only the legislature, but the Department of Education. We were waiting for a very important report that was coming out of the Education Commissioner's office on grading of the Vermont schools, trying to determine if any schools should be shut down in the state. The whole state was nervous anticipation about what kind of grading the local school would get. The report was supposed to be released on Thursday morning by Commissioner uh, Edward Gibbony. All of us, about 10 of us reporters, went into his office at 10 o'clock, and Gibbony said, sorry, folks, I can't release it today. Uh, it'll be tomorrow. Mavis said, where's the report? Gibbony patted his desk drawer, and he said, it's right there, and it's going to stay there. So he left the building, which is right across the street from the State House, that big white granite building, no, a marble building. And we all said we'd be back the next morning. As we were going out of the building, Mavis excused herself and went to the ladies' room. 
The next morning, as we reached the office, Mavis came dancing in with a copy of the Burlington Free Press in her hands. The whole damn report was there on page one. Jesus. I said, how did you get it? She said, I waited in that ladies' room for three hours, stood up on the commodes when they mopped it. When they, everybody left the building, I went back to Gibney's office. He left it open. The desk was open. I took the report out. And there it is. I said, Mavis, that's stealing. She said, like hell it's stealing. That report belongs to you and me as taxpayers just as much as it belongs to that commissioner. Oh, Kendall Wilde called me up. He was furious. I got totally scooped. <laughs> Two weeks went by. Two weeks went by. I was in shame. One Sunday night, I got a call does anybody remember Ron Reynolds? Taught at Woodstock High School. A great teacher. By then, he was chair of the state education board. I, he, he'd been my class advisor. He said, Howard, I've got a tip for you. Commissioner Gibney is resigning tomorrow morning. We don't like his report. Next morning, I walked into the news office, and there was Mavis sitting there, and I held up that paper, full banner headline, Gibney resigns this morning. Mavis said, you son of a bitch, Coffin, you knew that, Reynolds, from high school. <laughs> I said, I don't care how I win the game, Mavis, you just got beat. <laughs> and then she gave me a hug. She was a dear person, but. So that's the way it went. But I didn't do well covering the legislature, and Kendall Wilde brought me back to Rutland. He said, you're not ready for the legislature yet. He said, you proved to me that you can be a state reporter. He said, you go anywhere and do anything you want to and file stories and lots of them. It was the best job anybody ever had at the Rutland Herald. I began to wander the state anywhere I wanted to go, and I fed them stories by the hundreds. One of the first things I wrote about was Vermont flood control dams. You know, they're everywhere around the state. They were built after the 27 flood, and I started doing this series about how big they were and how much water they could hold and how they worked. And then I began to discover that there were a lot of people in Vermont who didn't like them. And there were a lot more planned, and there were people who were trying to stop them. And I listened to them, and I found out that I thought, by God, that they were right. There was one planned at Victory in the Northeast Kingdom that was going to flood about 5,000 acres of pristine Northeast Kingdom forest. I went up and camped there for a weekend. I couldn't believe the beauty of it. Moose were walking around. It was just a beautiful place. It never should have been flooded. And I started reporting on it, and I wrote story after story after story after story. U.S. Senator George Aiken, the dean of the U.S. Senate from Vermont, wanted that dam built beyond anything else. I hammered away at him week after week after week. One Wednesday evening, the phone rang in the Rutland Herald. Somebody said, Howard, it's Governor Aiken for you. Of course, he was a senator, but he always wanted to be called governor. I picked up the phone. Uh, governor, Governor, I said. He said, Howard, I guess we don't need that damn it victory after all. Click. <laughs> I danced around that newsroom. Let me tell you, it was probably the happiest moment of my reporting career. And that was on page one the next day. And then we took on dams at uh, Gaysville that would have flooded 10 miles of the White River Valley from Gaysville almost to Rochester. And we beat that one and then another one down at Cambridge Port. I didn't do it alone, of course, but boy, I helped them. I slammed away with story after story. The summer of 68, 
I was assigned, I think it was 68, am I right? To cover the licensing hearings for the Vermont Yankee nuclear power plant. Albert A. Creek, president of Central Vermont Public Service, had put together a power company to build a nuclear plant. Vermont Yankee was the name of the company. The Atomic Energy Commission held licensing hearings that lasted a couple of months in the uh, gymnasium at Brattleboro High School. Every morning, Cree, now, Mr. Holm over here worked for Cree, didn't you? Yes. Cree was a big man. He always dressed in suits. He was a serious man, formidable is the word I would use. And every morning as I arrived at the hearing room where there would be a couple hundred people gathered and, you know, there were uh, teams from Massachusetts, Lee, Attorney General's Office, New Hampshire, Vermont, I mean, all these conservation groups, Cree would be reading with a copy of the Rutland Herald in his hand. And if he liked the story I'd written, he'd praise me. But more often, he didn't like it. Then he would light into me. And I'd light right back into him. And we had a great time. I liked him. Uh, it was a good summer. After that finished, I was assigned to do a series of articles on the old prison at Windsor. There was a question in Vermont whether the old prisons should be torn down and new prisons built. I went down one day to Windsor to visit the warden, Bob Smith, and he gave me a day-long tour of the prison, took me to every nook and cranny. And while I was there, the prisoners found out a reporter was in the prison, and they rioted. They started a fire up under, the, up under the roof, and it really got serious. And fire trucks came from, I think, six or eight towns. The gates, the, 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 the prison would let the fire trucks in and then lock the gates. So Coffin was the only reporter in the prison. When I stood on the walls of the prison, there were 35 reporters trying to get in. And I knew all of them, and I was waving at him. You know? <laughs> and I got a tremendous exclusive, because I had my camera, I had all the pictures in there, and uh, it turns out that the prisoners wanted a new prison. And that's what they were rioting for. After they got the new prisons at St. Albans, St. Johnsbury, they hated them and wished they'd stayed in the old one at Windsor. Uh, it's another story I'll tell you sometime. I knew the last man executed in the electric chair at Windsor Prison. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe if we have time. It wasn't all serious business. One Friday afternoon, I was sitting in the Herald newsroom about two o'clock and the phone rang and I picked it up and this young man's voice said, are, are, are you a reporter? And I said, yes, I am. And he said, I've got a tip for you. I said, okay, what's up? He said, I'm calling you from Castleton. At three o'clock, a black van is going to come into the Rutland Shopping Center. You remember King's department store over there? Yeah. Big shopping center right in the middle of town. He said, a black van is at exactly 3 o'clock is going to stop at the south end of that parking lot. And two streakers are going to jump out. <laughs> They're going to run the length of the, of, the, of the shopping center. Be there. <laughs> well, I got a photographer. I wasn't a very good picture taker. I got one of our better photographers. We went over to the shopping center. I put the photographer right by the entrance to the department store, and I said, there's no sense in photographing them till they go by you, because they won't use head-on shots. <laughs> okay. 
So we waited. It got to be 10 of 3. It got to be 5 of 3. And about 3 minutes of 3, here comes this beat-up old Volkswagen bus. And it goes the length of the shopping center down to the south end. And right at 3 o'clock, the back doors open. And out jumps two young men, naked as the day they were born. And here they come at full speed. And there's hundreds of people shopping. And of course the boys are yipping and yowling, you know, and the people start clapping and oh boy. Here they come and by the time they get to our photographer, I notice that the one on the right is beginning to fade. He's running out of breath. His, his friend was fine, but they went by us People were cheering them on. And maybe 50 yards beyond the store, the one on the right just couldn't go any further. <laughs> His friend was running along, and he looked over, and no friend. So he looked back and saw him, you know? So he, you know, he was a gentleman. He went back and got his arm around him, and they kind of limped <laughs> the rest of the way. <laughs> and there was the van waiting, and they got in. They got in the van and off they went and we had some wonderful pictures. <laughs> when I was making these notes last night, uh, that incident reminded me of an incident that happened to me in basic training. I was a pretty good soldier and at the end of the eight to uh, ten weeks of training we had a parade. It was a Saturday and there were hundreds of people visiting Fort Dix. And down the main drag, our battalion paraded, about 500 men. And I was given the honor of carrying the flag. And so I was well out in front of the marching column and stepping along. I had to be all, you know, spit and shine, you know. And along I went, and the people along the sides were cheering, and the band was playing behind me. And, and I was walking along. And suddenly I began to notice things had gotten quiet. And I finally looked back, and there was nobody behind me. <laughs> the parade had turned right. <laughs> so I cut through some back lots, and finally, in about 10 minutes, was back at the head of the parade again. The sergeant, thank God, was laughing. Uh, <clears throat> My best friend in the Army was a guy named Frank Doherty, who was for 45 years a reporter for the Philadelphia Daily News. He's still my best friend. Uh, Frank kept me posted. <clears throat> he was looking for a Nazi, a camp guard from one of the concentration camps had come to settle in Philadelphia, and Frank was looking for him. And he got it. He did it for two months. Frank got up at 4 o'clock in the morning, drove to this guy's son's house, went through his garbage cans, and finally found a card sent from Cleveland by Daddy. And off to Cleveland, Frank went, and he caught himself a Nazi who was put on trial and deported. So Frank had caught himself a Nazi, and Howard wanted to catch himself a Nazi too. And Howard started looking around here, and he found one. In a brick house on Lake Champlain, just north of Whitehall, I learned that a man named Vilnes Hausners was living, who had been a guard at the... At the ghetto in Riga, Latvia, and apparently he had been a pretty horrible man. I decided that I would take on Hausner's unannounced. And one Saturday afternoon, I got a photographer named Harry Jaffe, who had just started work at the Herald, and he and I drove to Whitehall, and I went to the front door of this house, which was out in the country, knocked on the door, and a woman answered, a little white-haired lady. 
very attractive looking woman. And she said, yes, can I help you? And I said, I'm Howard Kaufman from the Rutland Herald. This is Harry Jaffe. We want to interview Vilnius Hausners. You can't. Why not? Because he's terribly sick and he's in bed. When is he going to be well? We don't know. Why do you want to talk to him? Because we understand that he was a prison, that he was a guard at the Riga ghetto. Oh, no, 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 no. You have the wrong man. All of a sudden, Harry Jaffe, who I really barely knew, busted by me, pushed the lady out of the way, and ran into the house, into the bedroom, and there was Vilnius Hauser in bed, and Harry, with his flashbulb, started firing pictures. I think he got about 40 pictures. And then all the screaming from the wife and Vilnius and so forth, Harry said, okay, I got it, let's go. So we're driving back to Rutland. <laughs> I never expected to see such a friendly-looking woman, a frail-looking woman, you know. But uh, I, said, I said to Harry, I said, what made you do that? And Harry Jaffe looked at me and said, Howard, I'm Jewish. Vilnius Hausners was deported to Poland and spent the rest of his life in jail as he should have. We did a front page story about that. I began covering politics. Every year the Rutland Herald covered the gubernatorial campaigns, the Senate campaigns, the congressional campaigns, full time. We traveled with the candidates for a week at a time. Wherever they went, we went. After a week, we shipped it. I spent weeks driving with Dean Davis, Phil Hoff, Winston Prouty, Bob Stafford, Tom Salmon, Dick Snelling, Dick Mallory, on and on it went. One of the early uh, campaigns I covered was a young state's attorney from Burlington named Patrick Leahy, who now is about to retire after serving more years than any senator in the history of the place. Unbelievable how time goes by. The pressure was always on us to scoop the other papers. One night, I was, uh, well, I was staying in a motel in Bennington, and I was sharing a room with a, a Burlington Free Press reporter named Steve Carlson, who incidentally was married to Eddie and Geneva Potwin's daughter. You remember the Potwins? Any of you remember the Potwins? You remember them, sure, they're dear people. We were in the same little room that night, uh, saving money for the papers. Just before I turned in for the night, fairly early, Leahy came up to me and said, I've got a poll on how this election's going. I'll give it to you exclusively if you can get out of there. So about 8.30, I went to bed. And Carlson said, what are you doing going to bed at 8.30? You don't go to bed till midnight. I said, I'm really tired, Steve. And so I got into bed, and Steve was sitting there reading. I said, Steve, turn off the lights. I can't, you know, I can't sleep with those lights on. And I waited, and I waited. About 10 o'clock, I could hear him snoring. So I went into the bathroom, shut the door, climbed out the bathroom window, went to Leahy's room, knocked on the door. He handed me the poll results. I was, wear, I was only wearing skivvies. And I found the phone booth, phoned in a story, just made it up. And we had a front page scoop the next morning. Carlson said, how did you get to that? And I said, well, I couldn't sleep. <laughs> I developed... I became the chief political reporter of the Rutland Herald. I started going back to Montpelier two days a week to cover state government. I loved it. I developed a wide range of sources. The best I ever had was House Speaker Walter L. Kennedy, Peanut Kennedy. He was a very funny man. He sold used cars over in Chelsea. One night I was covering a speech by President Gerald Ford in, the, in an arena over at St. Michael's College. 
<coughs> Ford was a very dull speaker, by the way. Then I got a little card. It's right here. Clearly in Peanut's hand, in the middle of the speech, which said, here's the original, if bullshit was snowflakes, what a blizzard we would be in. Signed, H. Ford Waterbed. That was at the Watergate time. We had fun. We worked hard to pass the major environmental bills, Act 250, the billboard law, the bottle deposit law. The toughest campaign I ever covered was Phil Hoff against Winston Prouty uh, for the United States Senate. It was a national election. The Republicans desperately wanted to hang on to that seat. Prouty was dying of cancer. He kept it a secret. He didn't want to run. Republican chairman of the state Republican committee at a meeting in Burlington said to him, Winston, you'll run if I have to carry you down Church Street on my back. He ran. Richard Nixon came to Burlington Airport to boost Prouty's campaign. I rode to the airport with Prouty and Governor Davis. I was standing at the, by Nixon's plane beside Dan Rather when we got a press release from the Nixon headquarters saying that protesters had thrown stones at Richard Nixon during his speech at the airport. Rather looked at me and he said, I didn't see any damn stones. And I said, I didn't either. History tells us that that was the first dirty trick of the Nixon campaign that eventually led to his Watergate, uh, his Watergate resignation. Watergate was another one of the dirty tricks. I covered the 76th Democratic Convention at Madison Square Garden. I will never forget the moment when two rows in front of me, there was an empty seat, and Jackie Kennedy walked in and sat down. She was the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. And 18,000 people in Madison Square Garden rose and cheered for 15 minutes. It was an extraordinary, extraordinary moment. That, at, during that convention, one morning I went to the Ambassador Hotel near Madison Square Garden to cover a meeting, a Democratic meeting. I walked into the huge lobby and I heard a familiar voice holler, Howard Coffin. I looked over to the desk, the hotel desk, and there was Governor Tom Salmon, who didn't like me. But Governor Salmon was on something of a holiday in New York, you see, and he was, re let's say he was relaxing. So he came over to me and he put his arm around me and he said, how are you this morning? How are you? He was unusually friendly because, you know, he, he didn't like my, I was a tough reporter. He didn't like, but anyway, he was, he was being perfectly friendly and suddenly there was a commotion and down the grand staircase came the speaker of the, from, of the U.S. House, Tip O'Neill of Massachusetts with that great mop of white hair with an entourage of probably 40 people. And Salmon, with his arms still around me, said, would you, Howard, would you like to meet the Speaker of the House? I said, what could I do? I said, yes. So we walked over to the bottom of the staircase. O'Neill came down, and Salmon said, Mr. Speaker, I would like you to meet a shining light of Vermont journalism, Mr. Howard Coffin. O'Neill stuck his hand out, and he was an immense man and, and powerful. And as he shook my hand, he drew me closer to him. And he said, it's nice to meet you, Mr. Coffin. Who the hell is that with you? <laughs> I said, Governor Salmon of Vermont. Governor Salmon, it's so nice to see you. <laughs> anyway, that and Jackie are the two things I most remember about that. Uh, and we're getting toward the end here. I, uh, <clears throat> Dick Snelling, of course, was elected governor. Dick Snelling didn't like me very well. 
I sort of liked him. He had run for governor years before, had a press conference over in Shelburne beside a, uh, a camper. He, he announced he was going to travel the state in a camper for economic reasons, to save money. Of course, he had all the money in the world, but that's what he was going to do. He was going to emphasize an economic government he would run by driving the state in a camper. The press conference ended, he got in the camper, and a half mile down the road he ran out of gas. <laughs> he never much cared for the press after that, because of course that was the story. Anyway, I had been by then covering state government a couple days a week. I developed sources all through state government. Snelling, in his second try, gets elected governor. I go up for his first press conference. In the morning before the press conference, I go through state government to see all my sources, and nobody would talk. They're all clammed up. Somebody scared them. So I went to the press conference. The press conference went on for an hour. At the end of the press conference, Snelling said, anyone have any more questions? I raised my hand. Governor Snelling, have you put a gag order on your administration? No, Howard, I have not put a gag order on my administration. Then how come nobody will talk to me? Well, maybe that's your fault, Howard. Uh, it's never happened before, Governor. Uh, Howard, uh, after the press conference, could you come in my office for just a minute? Yes, I will, Governor. So I, I walked in with Snelling. He slammed the door, and he said, Coffin, you are not going to ruin my governorship. And I said, Governor, you are not going to tell me what to write in the newspaper. And then it exploded. I didn't know that guy could swear like that. <laughs> and I could. I'd been in the army. Anyway, the years went by. I left the Rutland Herald in 1978 to go to work for another great newsman, Robert Graham, formerly of the Boston Herald, who ran the news office at Dartmouth College. And I had several wonderful years at Dartmouth. I continued as a freelance writer. And by the way, while I was a, the last six years I was working for the Herald, Mavis Doyle gave me her account with the Christian Science Monitor. And I began to write 50 to 100 stories a year for the Christian Science Monitor. It was one of the great newspapers in the world at the time. And I also, after I left newspapers, wrote for the Boston Globe, New York Times, Vermont Life. So I worked for seven years, wonderful years at Dartmouth. And then I worked for five years as news director at the University of Vermont. And then Jim Jeffords called and asked me if I would be his secretary. But just before he called, Dick Snelling called. Dick Snelling was governor. Dick Snelling was running against United States Senator Patrick Leahy for the U.S. Senate. And Dick Snelling said, Howard, would you have breakfast with me at the Shelburne Diner? I said, why, governor? He said, I want you to go to work for me. I went to breakfast with him the next morning. He said, Howard, I want you to come to work for me now you're the only one who can save this campaign. I said, no, thank you, Dick. We wouldn't get along anyway. He said, think it over. We got together the next morning, and I said no, with no hard feelings, and he lost very, very badly. And then, well, of course, Jeffords called, and I went to work for Jeffords for five years. Jim Jeffords, one of the dear friends that I ever had. And at age 50, with a couple of health problems, I quit Jim Jeffords, set up a consulting business, and began writing books. I never went back to newspapers, but they have never left me. The golden age of journalism made Vermont a different, a better state. The key to that 
age was the paper of record, the Rutland Herald. I worked there, I was blessed. It was a paper that honored and understood Amendment 1 of the U.S. Constitution, which says, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of the press or speech or the right of people to peacefully assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. God bless the First Amendment. It's under fire. May it stand. Thanks for listening, and I'll answer questions. How long did I go on? How long did I go on? I don't know, an hour. Oh, oh not long enough. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't Paul Rassico's girlfriend killed in that accident? If she wasn't killed, she was very badly injured. Right. She may have been. Paul was injured pretty bad too, wasn't he? Paul, Paul was pretty badly injured too. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I know, I'm, I'm virtually certain that Paul was trapped underneath a dead person for like two or three hours. You may be right about that. I can almost come up with her name. I think, wasn't she a teacher? Mm, I think so. I don't know. I don't I think she was a teacher down, maybe a substitute or something. I don't know. I met her once, I remember that, but I cannot remember, remember that name. Uh, yeah, it, uh, Paul, uh, you know, Paul was a pretty solid guy, you know. He, 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 very uh, 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 eloquently described the terror of the, as that car picked up speed, and he insisted it was going way more than forty miles an hour. When I when I worked at Seabrook, I worked with a welder who had worked at Mount Washington. He said, "Never ride a car. Never ride a car." Well, uh, my friend uh, Ever Demerit. Uh, uh, he never rode the, 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 the mm -hmm. cog again. He went over twice and started to buy a ticket and they looked at that thing and got back in the car and went home. <laughs> no sir, he said, never, never, never again. It was, uh, yeah, I, it's, uh, the, the, I, I was all over that engine. I don't remember being in the car it must have been roped off, or closed off, or something, because I do remember blood on the rocks. But uh, all of the, of course, all of the uh, dead and injured had been taken, uh, had been taken down of the night before, so so they were all gone. I did hear, I read a story the other day about a man who came up to a state policeman the night of the accident and uh, said, uh, can you please go up and get my little girl? She's only seven, and I don't want her up on that mountain all night. And the policeman said, well, there's, there's, there's a car going up to get, to get her now. She'll be all right. He said, no, she's dead. Mm -hmm. Reminds me of that school situation. Mm -hmm. Yes? Isn't it illegal to go into somebody's house and take their pictures without? <laughs> 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 like barging in like you did for Houseman? <laughs> 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 Who's the fifth? You have to make up there. You have to make a judgment. I was pretty damn well convinced that I had the right person. And I knew something about Hausner's. He was a brutal guard at, at Riga. And I figured, I'm going in. I don't know if I hadn't had Jaffe with me whether I would have backed off and given them a week or two to heal. 
at which point they may have disappeared, I don't know. But Harry left me, <laughs> Harry left me no choice, and he was right. He was right, and of course he had a real motivation. We got some wonderful pictures of Belus with the bedclothes up like this, you know, and, it, and, and, and Mrs. Hauser hollering, and uh, anyway, we had the guilty man, and was it illegal? We didn't get sued. But uh, I really think that if I had come back to the Rutland Herald and told the managing editor that I'd have to go back in a week because uh, Billness was, I think he'd have sent me right back over there. Uh, anyway, we got it. We got it. And that night I called my friend Frank Dougherty and said, I got one too. <laughs> yes. Do you have any thoughts about how we can move from the situation where competing cult philosophies have their own set of facts mm. that bear little relationship to reality? One of my standard answers to the dilemma we're in concerning government and truth and media and truth is that I'm very happy to be old. <laughs> <laughs> the New York Times did an admirable job of reporting on Donald Trump's presidency, and I believe they recorded over 20,000, almost 25,000 lies that he told in public during his presidency. If that didn't stir the American electorate, I'm not sure what it's going to. It certainly would appear right now as if uh, the Republicans will take back the Senate and House uh, next year. And certainly the early indications would be that Biden's in great trouble. I don't think Biden is going to run again. Uh, I don't think it will be Kamala Harris. Somebody's going to beat her in a, I think, in a primary. Uh, but it certainly looks very much like there's going to be a Republican president. I don't think it will be Trump. And I don't know where we go from there. I really, I really, really don't. Uh, it looks like the country is going to come apart. It looks like we're on the edge of a civil war. But as we're finding out in the Ukraine, in a world with nuclear weapons, nothing makes old time sense anymore. And I, I just don't know. And I don't know, frankly, if we do have some kind of a, <clears throat> a resurrection in this country, which way will the military go? Will they divide? Where will the ones go that have the nuclear weapons? I mean, we are sitting on the edge of a huge disaster, and I really don't know what to do about it. There needs to be some strong pronouncements by the United States Supreme Court, but the court is not up for that right now. They're going in the wrong direction. I don't have much hope. I really don't have much hope. And uh, yes, it is nice to be older, <laughs> but I also feel helpless. I don't know what to do. Yes? Um, going from print to digital, that instantaneous you know, digital news reporting, is, do you think it's good, bad, or it seems like when it was like in print, there seemed to be enough time to, yes, you want to scoop everyone, but to put some thought into what you wrote before it went out, as opposed to almost instantaneously trying to beat the other person that the facts aren't as, you don't 
really get to the truth of the facts before you have to try and push it out because of the instantaneous nature of, of the digital world now. We, <laughs> a little time for caution is a valuable asset. I'll give you an example of that. One night, a young reporter, whose name I won't mention, uh, who was there when I went to work at the Herald in 66, good reporter, third baseman on our softball team, <laughs> had a beautiful blonde wife. Bob came in late one night with pictures from a shooting. And we were right on deadline, and Kendall told the dark room to get, get one of those pictures for page one. As long as you could, as long as it wasn't totally Ill illegible, because Bob wasn't much of a photographer. He said, just slap it on page one. And uh, well, we had a rookie dark room man on that night. And he developed Bob's role of film. And uh, he got a picture printed, and he wasn't clued in as to what was going on. And he got, he, he got the picture developed and sent it out to the composing room to put it in the paper, and finally got up his courage to go over to the formidable Kendall Wilde and said, Mr. Wilde, I'm not sure that picture is the one you want on page one. He said, well, we were all set with it. Let's roll. He said, Mr. Wilde, I think you better go look at it. So Mr. Wilde went out to the composing room, and there about to go on page one was a picture of Bob's naked wife. <laughs> <laughs> Had it been a digital process, she probably would have been incredibly famous in Rutland the next morning. <laughs> That's true. Uh, <laughs> anyone else? In my question, I'm in no hurry. Howard, what's yeah. your assessment of Maggie Hagerman's work? Maggie Hagerman? Tell me who Maggie Hagerman is. New York Times. Oh, uh, yeah. She's good. She's good. Uh, the best... best reporter in America today is Jane Mayer of the New Yorker. See her often on television. And I'm proud to say she was my protege. She started at the Rutland Herald. And I kind of broke her in and she now is She's the best. She does the tough stories. <clears throat> Great stories in the London Herald. And I'm going to brag now. <laughs> Been doing it all afternoon. We, had, we were on a panel together two years ago at the State House. We had lunch and, and we sat down for the panel and she reached over and hugged me and she said, You're one of my heroes, Howard. My God, that was so nice of her. I never went anywhere. Hell, I got to the to the uh, Christian Science Monitor, and that was all. But I, you know, I, I wanted to do other things. I wanted to write books. She is a an extraordinary, an extraordinary uh, reporter. Bob Hager was a good crisis reporter. Mm -hmm. He was very good at plane crashes and disasters like that. He didn't know politics at all, but he. He did well with that kind of, uh, we had some very, very good reporters that came out of the, the, the Rutland Herald. John Cotton won a Pulitzer with the, uh, uh, with the Providence Journal. Uh, Tony Marrow, who was my brother's roommate at UVM, uh, won a Pulitzer with Newsday. The Rutland Herald won a Pulitzer uh, about 20 years ago. Uh, oh, they sent uh, reporters all over the world because of Wild, how he trained them. It, it was wonderful, a, a great place to work. Incidentally, I had a great time. Just two quick Christian Science Monitor stories. 
Mavis Doyle would, died at 53. She had a, she had, she smoked too much. She didn't drink. Her husband was now taller. Uh, but she just wore herself out. She worked so hard. She had a big family, a drunk husband, and she just wore herself out. But she, when she gave me the Christian Science Monitor account, she was doing about 10 stories for the monitor. And the monitor paid per story. So I, I talked to the editor, Leon Lindsay, in Boston. And he said, you just send me down the best story you're working on right now. Let me see what you can do. So the best story I was working on for the Christian Science Monitor was a story about a guy trying to open an X-rated movie in Hardwick. <laughs> that story came back within a week, and I never saw so many red marks on the story. <laughs> and then the phone rang, and it was Liam Lindsay, and he said, Howard, get down to Boston. You can write, but you need to learn something about the Christian scientists. <laughs> And we went down there, we got our heads together, I learned some things, and I had six years, and I made good money uh, working for them. Uh, when well, Alexander Solzhenitsyn came to Vermont, biggest story in Vermont, town meeting came around. Of course, you couldn't get near him. He was up in the hills there. And I said to Kendall Wilde, I said, I think Solzhenitsyn's going to go to Cavendish town meeting. I want to go. He said, go ahead. But as election night approached, it was a big election night. Wilde came over to me and said, you can't go tonight to Cavendish. He says, you've got to do the main political story. You're going to have to stay here. So they sent Louis Bernie instead. And sure enough, Solzhenitsyn eats and walked in. And Bernie had that damn story for years, made him all kinds of money. But, the Christian Science Monitor, a couple months later, called me and said, we want a story on, uh, we want a, uh, a fold-out story, two-page story on Souls and Eats. Try to get to see him, but go down there and talk to the local. I did. There was a fence around his house, about this high, a wire fence. And I wanted to get, I couldn't, they wouldn't let me in. I got a hold of his wife, she wouldn't let me come in and talk. I couldn't even see the house from the road. So I decided to climb the fence <laughs> with my camera and go and get it, go close enough to get a picture of the house. So I got over the fence, it was quite a struggle. And I started walking through the woods and I began to see uh, the white clapboards through the trees. And I was getting ready, and I heard, Roo, yeah. Roo. and oh my god. Yeah. When I was a kid, I got bit, seat by a big dog down on Pleasant Street in Woodstock. This is Dana's. <laughs> and I turned around, and I ran as fast as I could. <laughs> and it was getting loud. I, Roo, Roo, Roo. And I leaped on that fence and just threw myself over. I was lying under there. And by the time I landed, those dogs, big dogs, were right there. That was it as far as trying to get the souls of each. <laughs> but I worked that into my story and I, you know, talked to the neighbors and got a good story, but I never did get to meet Souls and Eats it except one day my brother and I, my twin brother and I, here he is right here with my Aunt Julia, were standing by the road up in Reading drinking beer, and this jeep drove by, and it was Souls and Eats, and he had on a cowboy's hat. <laughs> we raised the beer to him. <laughs> close to side of it, not too many yes. But Jim Jeffords was a close friend of him, and he got me a signed book from him. That was nice. Yes? How many newspapers do you read now, a day? How many papers do I read a day? <laughs> I read the New York Times, the Boston Globe, which is my favorite paper. I, I, I did a lot of stories for the Globe. What makes it your favorite? The Globe. I like the writing. I like the way they cover. I, I love Boston. I like the way they cover the city. But they've gotten to be a much more localized paper, so if you want national news, you have to read the Times. And I read, uh, don't always read the Rotman Herald anymore. The Times Argus, which is its sister paper, and 
Usually I look at the Vermont standard. Usually I do look at the Vermont standard, yes. Uh, which does a pretty good job of, of covering news. You know, uh, the Herald tried to cover all of Vermont, you know. And what it did, the, the state editor's name was Aldo Marusi. He was a famous photographer. He was called Norman Rockwell of photographers. But he also was a state editor, and he had local reporters in many, many, many of the small towns. And once a, once a month, they were to send in a, a list of things that happened in town. Mrs. Perkins called on Mrs. Harlan Friday. Uh, things like that. You know, the Grange met Thursday. Forty people were there. That's what it was. And they got five dollars a month. Most of them were women. But sometimes it didn't work. Aldo came in to work one morning and Kendall had put the Burlington Free Press on his desk. And the front and the lead story in the Burlington Free Press was Jesso Boy Murders Parents in Rochester. Bodies found in trunk in attic. Kid was 16. Elva had nothing in the paper. So he called. Burl Wayne, the elderly lady who is his reporter in Rochester at $5 a month, and said, Burl, what about that murder last night? Why didn't you call me? Did you know anything about it? And Burl Wing said, yes, Eldo. The, the town was full of cops, and all these lights were flashing. But they were so busy, I didn't think I ought to bother them. <laughs> and then, and then another situation, front page headline, unidentified body pulled from Pulteney River in Fairhaven. Nothing in the Rutland Herald. Kendall's theories. There was a young man that covered Fairhaven. Can't think of his name. Aldo called him up and said, why didn't you call me about that body they found in the Pulteney River? And the kid said, well, I was down there all night along the river. And he said, oh, there were cops everywhere. And they got him out of there, finally. She smelled awful, he said. Uh, he said, well, why didn't you call me? He said, hell no, they didn't know his name. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it was going to be tough covering you. Uh, covering news in the small town, you know, when, the, when, the, when the big stories came down, came down the road. Uh, Refreshment time, one more? Yeah, I just think about some history here. I walked into the Alamo and the flags were each representing loads in the Alamo from what state they were from. And lo and behold, here's the Vermont flag. There was a, Rhonda lost at the Alamo, I believe. Right, and there was an article in the Herald about Miles Safar Sandros. And who was, do you remember who the guy was? A professor, I think it was, who wrote that article. I don't know. Yeah, that's oh, quite, quite a while ago. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think it may have been Frank Small, but I'm not sure. Yeah, maybe. I'll be there. Okay. Yeah. Wherever you are. Well, thanks for listening. <laughs>